Calatayud for joining with us this webinar. Thanks to Francisco Mascareño to be the moderators today. Uh, we have today a special topic. Uh, it's called Citizen Science and Tourists for Shark Conservation. Uh, this interesting webinar will be presented by the director of Mexico Azul, Clara Calatayud. Thanks so much to follow all the transmissions on live. These webinars um, are supported by Pangea Seed Foundation, Sea Walls Artists for Ocean, with the collaboration of Mexico Azul, Pelagios Cacunja, and Pronatura Noreste. Thanks so much, Francisco and Clara, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So before we begin, uh, let me introduce Clara to everyone. Uh, Clara is a marine biologist that was born in Barcelona. She studied um, biological sciences at the University of Barcelona with a major in uh, marine zoology and ecology. In 2006, she moved to the Seychelles Islands mm -hmm. and she worked as a project leader for a turtle nesting uh, project there. And then she continued her work as a marine biologist in a ship while she was pursuing also he, uh, a master degree in oceanography and marine ecology. And um, after that, she went to Baja to uh, enroll in a pre-doctoral uh, project with Pelagios Cacunja about uh, diver shark interactions in the Revillagigedo archipelago uh, for recreational shark diving. And then in 2015, she founded uh, the Shark Odyssey, which was a citizen science program and scientific tourism program in, in the Baja Peninsula with sharks. And um, since 2017 and until now, She's been the director and science coordinator of Mexico Azul Foundation in Mexico City. And right now, he's, she's going to talk about um, one of our main projects, which is uh, citizen science and tourism for shark <laughs> conservation. So go ahead, Clara. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Kiko, for the introduction. I'm lucky enough to work with Kiko a lot, so he knows a lot about my life as well. And we have been sharing this amazing project in Cabo for like two years already as a scientific team. So with no more introduction, I'm going to start talking about the seminar, the webinar today, which is Citizen Science and Tourism for Shark Conservation. And uh, I'm going to start just telling you a little bit about Mexico Azul. Let me put the volume down. So we are an NGO in Mexico. We have been working for more than three years with uh, citizen science interactions, specifically with sharks. We do different kind of projects to get divers and uh, people who like uh, interact with marine uh, animals to get the opportunity to be as well as part of a research team for a few days. So that's one of our main goals as an NGO in Mexico, specifically because in Mexico we are lucky enough to have a lot of animals, marine fauna to interact with. Uh, apart from these citizen science projects in Mexico, we also work with fishermen uh, communities to help them find alternatives, specifically when they are shark fishermen. But uh, let's talk about what is very kind of a, a common uh, concept now where it's called citizen science. So what is exactly a citizen scientist? What's the point of citizen science? Citizen science is like a new tool that a lot of scientists are embracing lately because it's been very useful to study species and um, kind of in places and locations that without this activity it would be very hard to get information. So if you want to be a citizen scientist, what is the, what is the follow? What is the pro process to follow? Well, the point is like people who are not scientists, maybe they are divers or they are just tourists participating in a marine activity, they can be a part of a scientific study, supporting this scientific study through different ways. They can either be collecting data or they can even help us just with the logistics. For example, when we are uh, working with sharks in Cabo San Lucas, which I will explain right now, we are using a tour operator as platform. So every time the tourists are going to a shark tour, one of our biologists is invited on board so we can record all the data of the shark tour operation and we don't have to pay for all 
the logistics like the boat, the crew, or the gasoline, because thanks to the tourism platform, that is already covered. So with this citizen science participation, we are looking to like engaging general public into marine conservation, and tourism is a perfect vector for doing that. So in our case, we're using citizen science and tourism for two main goals, which is pelagic shark monitoring in an area which is Cabo San Lucas, that it has not been really studied yet regarding uh, pelagic sharks. And also we want to estimate the socioeconomic revenue. It means how much money do these sharks alive worth for the ecotourism industry in that point, especially in Cabo San Lucas, which is a very new destination for shark diving. It's not established yet as a shark point. It's been recent since shark operators are working in the area of Cabo San Lucas. But let's talk a little bit about shark tourism. So shark tourism is a new uh, kind of tendency, a new, a new kind of um, activity related to diving or snorkeling that a lot of people is trying to get involved now. Sharks are being very emblematic species. But what is shark tourism, uh, tourism useful for? One of the first points is that shark tourism is a perfect outreach channel. What does this mean? It means that, for example, when we go into a shark tour as a tourist, many of the times one of the people who are coming into the tour is willing to swim with the sharks. But there is always a, a friend or the husband or the wife or someone who goes with this crazy adventurer who is not so uh, fascinated or maybe is scared about swimming with a wild shark. Thanks to this platform of tourism, we can make this change in the mind of people. So people, when they interact with a shark for first time and they get in the water with a shark and they get to see the shark in their own habitat and they see how the shark is pretty much elusive and is avoiding human contact, there is a kind of a change in the state of mind and people start getting more kind of understanding the animal. So tourism is like the perfect platform to explain a lot of people why sharks are not human ears, but just wild animals. Data source, and this is one of the points that from scientific point, uh, for scientific research is more interesting. So all of these uh, shark tour operators, uh, these tourism platforms, if we could actually create like a kind of a data collection and we could standardize all this data, all of these operators being in the water every day, interacting with marine animals every day, if we could standardize all this data collection, that would be an amazing and invaluable uh, information regarding uh, pelagic marine fauna, specifically in Baja, where the tourism is still flourishing in that point as shark tourism destination. The economic revenue, all of the tourism activities, of course, they, they mean that it means that they have an economic revenue, direct and an indirect economic revenue. The direct economic revenue would be the money that the tourist is willing to pay to see the shark, how much is the tour, and how much do they need to spend for the tour during, um, the, uh, during the shark tour in the area. But also this tourist is paying for hotels, for food, for transportation, and that's what we could say there is the indirect economic revenue. As well, another important uh, point that shark tourism is also performing is surveillance. There are many points of shark observation, which are MPAs, marine parks, and they are pretty far away from like the coast. So many times the point that we have liveaboards, diving boats on the area, they are also working as a kind of a surveillance team. So the illegal poachers are not uh, are not daring to go into the marine park if they see tourism boats because they know they are going to be reported. So surveillance is also one of the benefits that are coming from shark tourism as an industry. And of course, we, we don't want to be like uh, naive and we have to accept that it may have some potential negative consequences, shark tourism interaction with sharks, but I think that is going to be very depending on the conditions that we are performing this activity and we're going to talk about this a little bit later. At the end of the day, tourism, shark tourism is, in, is increasing the value of alive sharks, and that is the, one of the most valuable points of the activity. We are located in Mexico. So Mexico, we have a great potential for shark tourism. Um, we are able to see the great white shark in Guadalupe Island. We are also able to see aggregation, natural aggregation of whale sharks in La Paz Bay. There are many of different options of shark tourism. If we're thinking about the tourism in Guadalupe Island with the great white shark, 
we know there is going to be a cage, it's going to be a liveaboard, so we will have to be traveling for two or three days on the boat in order to arrive to Guadalupe and see the great white sharks. And there is a, a cage in between us and the animal for protection. Uh, then we have another kind of uh, shark tourism, which could be, for example, the whale shark aggregation in La Paz. This is also going to be a season a uh, few months a year, but these animals in La Paz Bay, they will congregate naturally for feeding areas. So this interaction is going to be a little bit different. There is not a cage and people are just snorkeling and they can go on a day tour. So it's a different kind of situation than the one before. We can also go for shark diving in Mexico to Cabo Pulmo, one of the most successful marine reserves in the world. And here we have uh, a population of bull sharks, which is naturally there. There is no feeding, it's an MPA. So there are no provisioning methods allowed in the area. We can also go to Cabo San Lucas, which is the point where we are studying. We will talk about it later. And we can also dive in Revilla Gijedo Archipelago, uh, Archipelago, as Kiko was saying before. Mauricio, I think, gave us a lot of information yesterday about these islands. And on these islands, again, we have to go on a boat, on a liveaboard, spend a week diving in the area. And there is a great diversity of sharks in Revilla Gijedo Archipelago. Again, here you need to be a diver. In Cabo San Lucas or in La Paz, you can go as a snorkeler. So as you can see, we have also other options in the other side of Mexico. So it depends on the animal and in the conditions. The shark tourism is gonna to be different. It's gonna be with a cage or without a cage, with provisioning methods or no provisioning methods, diving or snorkeling. So we have different situations regarding shark tourism. In Mexico, we are very lucky to be able to see all these species uh, almost all year round in different locations. Okay, we have also to give some important information, which is of 113 species of sharks in Mexico, only three of them are protected by the national law. So we NGOs are kind of, uh, we have the obligation to work towards the protection of these sharks because uh, we need to enforce these conservations, especially since we know that they are worth more life than death. Okay, so Let's talk about a little bit what can we do as a citizen scientists and tourism, what, how, how can we apply science a little bit while we are performing a, uh, a non-scientific activity. For example, we want to go see the whale sharks and if you are part of a scientist, uh, uh, citizen science team, you will have to be trained. This is very important because uh, the citizen science, the problem it has is that we have a lot of people recording uh, data uh, on the sharks they are interacting with. And these people might not be trained scientists. So there is the possibility that the record of this data might have a bigger error if it was only done by a team of scientists. So this is kind of a, gonna be kind of solved by a very specific training, for example, the species ID training, size estimation training, or how to take good pictures. Let's see what is a size estimation. Here we have a little video. You can see a whale shark, that's La Paz Bay. And we are using here laser photogrammetry, which is me, it's a very simple system. It's like a PVC bar. And then we put a camera, a GoPro sometimes, and two underwater lasers. So what we are doing is projecting to like these two lasers on the body of the shark. Then we get the picture of the video. And then we can tell the computer that from point to point, it's 50 centimeters, let's calculate the whole size of the shark. And this is something we can do in an activity during tourism uh, if we have the materials and the scientists who tell us how to operate the lasers. Another interesting uh, thing is about the visual sensors. We can do this with uh, scuba diving or snorkeling. And it's uh, a simple kind of counting how many species of sharks do you see during a dive? Again, training is essential. The scientists must tell the divers how to identify different shark species because it's not the same thing a picture the seeing the actual animal in front of you in their habitat. So this needs a little bit of training, but visual senses is one of the basic uh, methodologies that we are using to understand the community or the population of shark that we are interacting with. Another important and very useful tool for conservation and to help know more about the sharks in their natural habitat, it could be photo ID. 
Photo ID is a system that has been extremely used, especially with the whale shark. A lot of people know they can take a picture of a whale shark, get it into a database like wildshark, uh, wildbook.org, and they will get the information if this whale shark has seen before, if this whale shark is in the database or it's a new individual. So we can also do this with other species, but not all the species are so simple to do photo ID with. I will explain this a little bit later with our project. Um, what can we do with le this long-term monitoring data that is coming from the citizen science and tourism platform? Well, there are different things that we could actually uh, think about. Uh, let me put the volumes down again. One of them is the population baseline. So that is what actually happened to us in Cabo San Lucas. We were uh, there in the area and we actually had no information of our sharks in Cabo San Lucas. And thanks to this partnership with the tour operator Cabo Shark Dive, we have been able to monitor for like three years in a row, almost in a daily uh, basis, uh, what are the sharks that are being seen the, during the tourist operation. That is gonna give us information about the population baseline of the sharks there. So we didn't know anything about the area. And after three years, we have learned a lot about what kind of shark species, how many uh, of them we cannot tell yet, but we're working on it. But are they female, are they uh, male? And are they coming the adults or we're having all the pre adults stage? This is kind of the population information that we can find out just by observation and visual senses. If we go a little bit far in, the in time, if we do this one year and the second year and the third year, if we have a long-term monitoring year by year, we can also know about the seasonal occurrence. That means maybe during the summer, we have some specific shark species, and during the winter, we have other shark species. And after two or three years of monitoring, we can see this, uh, there is a pattern of uh, seasonal occurrence of these species. Also, we are able to identify some species interactions. We have been uh, checking some of our videos and suddenly we see that one of the sharks is suddenly leaving the scenario of our shark tour and suddenly another species or a bigger individual is coming from somewhere else. So this is helping us to understand how sharks are interacting in between species or in between sizes and who is dominating uh, in the scene when we are interacting with them in the open ocean. Also, this kind of information can tell us more about behavior. And one of the things we're very interested is about how are shark interactions with humans? Are they getting closer? It depends on the species. Are the attraction methods also gonna work different for each of the species? Or they are gonna be the same kind of interaction? It doesn't matter if you have a mecho shark or a hammerhead. So this is something we are very lucky because in Cabo, because the um, shark tourism is still developing, we, ha we will be able to see the before and the after uh, of this progress by, uh, while the shark tourism is getting established in the area. So let's talk about Cabo San Lucas. Um, Cabo San Lucas is placed in Mexico. So in Mexico, we have Baja California Peninsula. And at the very end of the Baja California Peninsula, this little tip, we have Cabo San Lucas. As we said before, shark tourism has been an amazing uh, boom uh, in the last years. And there is more like, more than a half million people is estimated to travel around the world every year to go to shark diving destination. There is more than 83 diving spots already kind of recorded for shark diving and more than 300 operators around the world that are offering this kind of activity to interact, dive or swim with sharks around the world. As we were saying before, Mexico is one of the best, I think, destinations for that reason. And only uh, there is a recent study that we are, I'm putting in the presentation, just a little bit of, of a table with data. And this data is basically telling us that the nature-based marine tourism in Baja California is estimated to be five, uh, 512 million USD per year, more or less, which is a lot. So why is Baja California such an interesting point? Why are we working there? What is in this area that it makes it such an amazing place for shark tourism? Well, Baja California Peninsula has a specific kind of a specific conditions. First of all, 
it is a, true point, a crucial point where two important currents, the North Equatorial current and the California current, get together. So when we have these two currents getting together, that is going to create a wellings, which is high productivity. Moreover, all the Sea of Cortez, all the Gulf of California, it has a very sharp and deep coastline because it's volcanic origins. So if we put together this steep coastline, habitat variety, high productivity, the result is a very high biodiversity. And is exactly at this tip of this little area that I'm putting here in orange, perfect scenario for pelagic sharks study. So we believe this area of Cabo San Lucas, we, we have found more um, abundance of sharks than we expected because it's a very, we believe, a kind of a key point from a lot of migratory species. Um, we have been working with four of them until now. Let me, and let me now explain you about our process in Cabo San Lucas. How did we start working in Cabo and how, we, how has been our uh, continuation so far? Okay, 2017, we got our partnership with the official Cabo Shark Dive is a, a tour operator that has been working in Baja California so for four or five years now. So we got a partnership with them. And thanks to this partnership, we were able to be on the boat a lot, uh, Kiko and myself, to gather the scientific data during the tours. After this first year, we realized that we had to like, enforce this long-term monitoring through this tour operator. So we started training the crew. So the crew, they are photographers, they are expert shark divers, but they were not very familiarized with the data sheets or with the reporting or recording. Uh, scientific information. So that was kind of our job to interact with the crew, to uh, kind of design data sheets, to give them the data sheets on board so they could try them. So we have been try and error until we have become to a good uh, kind of trade-off where we can give them kind of simple but useful uh, sheets and they will be able to fill in the information almost at every tour, also with the pictures. That is the most important part of the citizen science, which is the training. So all of the observers can have the most accurate information as possible. Also in 2018, we started to, uh, making tourists, the participants of this shark tourism platform of this on the boat, we were trying to make them part of it. So we will explain them about the sharks. We will make them uh, help us with the pictures and take some information about water temperature, uh, wind conditions. That was the second phase. After that, we had already enough scientific information after two, three years to start creating a database for science and start creating a scientific report. And after that, we also thought that we have an, an amazing and extensive photo gallery. And thanks to this photo gallery, we could do a lot of uh, kind of new points of view to do research for the sharks. So in 2019, with this photo gallery, we were thinking, okay, we have so many pictures of sharks from 2017, 2018, and 2019. Let's do something useful with it. So we kind uh, of get an alliance with a university and Microsoft. And in 2020, maybe 2021, we are expecting that we can actually have uh, finished our open software for the ID of the macro sharks. This is gonna be our final results uh, from all this citizen science process and we hope it's gonna be working this year. So, after so many years working with sharks in Cabo, what have we learned more or less? Well, first of all, we have seen four main species in the area. First of all, the sil silky shark, Carcarinus falciformis, also the smooth hammerhead shark, the meko shark, and also the blue shark. The blue shark has been a little bit of a surprise because it just came around 2018 and 2019. It wasn't there the years before. So there is a kind of a variation of the species, but this is our, this is for our main species that we interact during the whole year in Cabo San Lucas. Um, after these uh, three years of monitoring these species, sorry, we had, uh, we were able to do like some basic information, statistical information, and we have presented this in different congresses. For example, for the silky shark here, you can see that there are like two graphics. One of them is the abundance of the sharks in three different years 
in during the 12 months of the year. And on the right side, you will see the temperature line. So we can see that the silky shark, after three years of monitoring almost daily, we can see there is like a very affinity, a lot of affinity between the silky shark and warm waters. So we know the silky shark is gonna be around Cabo when the water temperature is around 22, 23, 24 degrees Celsius and ahead. On the other hand, the smooth hammer during these three years, it didn't really show a clear affinity for any specific temperature. And what we understand is that hammerheads, smooth hammerheads are coming when there is a mix of water. It's not cold, it's not warm, it's mixing. There is no good visibility, no very good visibility and a lot of wind. That's where the hammerhead comes and disappears. And our last uh, beautiful species is the necro shark, Isurus oxyrhynchos. Uh, the short fin necro shark. And here you can see as well in the graphics, after three years of citizen science and tourism monitoring, we were able to understand that the necro shark was very much, uh, uh, was coming especially when the water was very cold. That is especially generally February, March. So we know more or less when the necro sharks are expecting to arrive to Cabo because of three years long-term monitoring project. As we were saying before, we were not only able to do our scientific report, but we were also able to start a photo ID project. At the beginning, we were trying to go through all these macro shark pictures, and we were looking for like very uh, kind of uh, clear signs of that that macro, I'm not gonna be able to think it's another macro. So, Okay, I can tell this mecho is mecho number one because it has a clear deformation in the back column. It has uh, maybe a very a clear scar on the head. So we started working on that direction. We were, uh, we were noticing that that was gonna be extremely hard because mecho sharks, they don't have a specific color pattern or a specific line like the whale shark does or like the great white shark does. So they have nothing. They are very, like the color is the whole color in the same body all the time. There is no specific lines. So we was very hard with uh, our eyes to identify different mechos one by one. So we had a lot of uh, kind of scientific questions or research questions like, okay, we know we have found pretty, a pretty interesting population of mecho sharks in Cabo. We didn't expect that. But are the sharks that we see in these mecho sharks year after year the same mecho sharks? Are they coming every year? Or maybe the sharks that we saw in 2017 are not the sharks we saw in 2018 and 2019. Maybe they come to Baja every two or three years. Maybe they come every year. We don't know. We also wanted to know if the sharks were staying around Baja for a long time or maybe they just stay for two, three days and they go, we know they are highly migratory. So we don't expect them to spend, to be like a resident in the area. But we wanted to know high, uh, how, what was the site fidelity of the species? We still don't know about it. So there are many questions that we could actually be trying to answer through all this photo, uh, this photo gallery that we have been accumulating thanks to Cabo Shark Dive and the photographers of Cabo Shark Dive. So with all these questions, last year, we were lucky enough to get together with La Salle University and with Microsoft. And together, we are developing uh, this Mako Shark ID software. It is gonna be a very long process. We're working on it, and we are very great, grateful for uh, Artificial Intelligence for Earth from Microsoft program to help us doing all of this uh, software progress. And we expect that at the end of the year, or maybe, 2021, we are still working on it, we will be able to use this open software to understand if every time we make a picture of a mecho shark and we put it inside this software in the database, this should tell us if this mecho shark is a new one on the database or is already been identified. So it would help us answering a lot of questions and that's one of the magics of tourism and citizen science. We don't even need to touch the shark just with pictures day by day, day by day, we get very good information. Okay, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit now about uh, the provisioning methods. Let's be honest and let's uh, admit that for a shark tourism operation, sometimes it depends on the conditions, we need to do like provisioning or shark attraction methods. 
this means that we're going to be using some kind of attraction uh, materials to make sure that the sharks are going to be around the point where and we can guarantee an interaction for the tourism. Otherwise, this kind of uh, operators would not be able to operate on a daily basis and through the year. So one of the most kind of, uh, let's say, non-invasive techniques is the flashers. You can see them here on the video. The flashers are non-organic attractants. So it is just like a kind of a line with a lot of mirrors. It is hanging into water. And specifically for like the mako shark, which is a very visual predator, it is going to be a very uh, useful um, it's going to be a very useful tool for us and we don't have to do anything just putting the flashers in the water and the sharks just being attracted by what they see they see a lot of lights it feels like they see a school of fish they get closer to it we have another attraction method here okay the chumming Chumming, as you can see here, there is a bucket full of like fish carcasses and we are not putting the fish in the water. What we are doing is just creating a kind of a soup with like the blood of the fish and some of the guts of the fish and we're pouring this into the water. We are very far um, from the bottom of the ocean because we are actually in a very deep area. And in there, what we are doing with the cham is creating on the surface of the water a path of smell. And we also kind of use sometimes the bait. Okay, what is the difference between the chumming and the bait? The chumming is just like this liquid soup that we pour into the water. It's getting very far away, away with the current. And what we are expecting is like these animals that are far away in the Pacific Ocean, they smell because of the current. It's, being, it's like uh, putting the cham away very far. We are expecting these animals to follow the path so they can know where the source of this smell is coming from. And that's uh, the boat for the tourist operation. The bait is something very different. The bait is, as you could see in the video, is like a rope. And at the end of the rope, we put normally a tuna carcass. That is gonna help us to uh, operate the animal and to be able to handle a little bit where is it moving. If we want it to be a little bit farther from the tourist uh, activity or a little bit closer for a picture if we are working uh, especially specifically for pictures for the photo ID. We also have sometimes in the water which we call a cham box. Also this animal is not getting fed from the cham box. It is a box that is enclosed and there are a lot of fish carcasses down there and it, it, it helps us because we can put it a little bit down like five or ten meters down and this will keep the shark interested in the cham box five meters below us. So this will give us a very good sight of the animal to take all the information, laser measurements, sex, or whatever else we need to see from upwards. Also, it's gonna give us a very safe perspective of the activity when the shark is below us. But of course, we, we have to wonder ourselves, are we actually, are there any potential or negative consequences regarding this provisioning? What I would like to say in our, in our specific situation, because we are working in Cabo San Lucas, and as we said before, we are working in depths around 700 meters, 1,000 meters depth. So we don't see the end, we don't see the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that's one of the good things of Cabo. You go very uh, little out of the coast and you suddenly are 1,000 meters deep. So because we're working very, uh, deep uh, with no bottom and we're working with highly migratory species. I mean these sharks that we are interacting with they are not residential, they are not staying in Cabo. There is no reef, there is no area for them to stay, they are just passing through. So it is very hard for us to condition this kind of sharks because we know they are going to be just there for a couple of days or maybe weeks. Um, but of course we need to think that some of the uh, consequences depends on the operation. If you're working with reef sharks in a very shallow area and you're going to feed them every day at the same time, of course this shark is going to kind of learn and it's going to be conditioned and it can kind of have a change of the behavior. We believe that in the conditions that we are working and we cannot tell yet, we should do the 
study before and after, maybe in five years, we might have all the information to be sure about this. But what we have seen so far is that the animals, they don't come, uh, like the speed of arrival is not getting shorter through the years. This means that the animals that we are seeing every year might not be always the same animals. So that is gonna make it very hard to condition their behavior. And well, that is a little bit everything from my side. I think uh, I did a 40 minutes presentation so far and I would be very happy to start answering questions. I think it's a, a very kind of more dynamic if we can interact and answering and questions and answers, right? Yes, thank you so much, Clara, for this uh, beautiful and interesting presentation about sharks. We know uh, that Mexico Azul and a lot of organizations make a lot of efforts to keep alive and protect these beautiful animals. And well, we have a lot of questions. Nice. And Francisco <laughs> will be a star to read it. Okay, so Sharks for Us asks, as a marine biology student and certified NOM 09 tourist guide, how can I join your projects? Oh, that would be great. I mean, well, that is a question that we get a lot because um, a lot of people are willing to interact with wild sharks. Um, we would be happy to be able to tell everybody, come and join our boat and get into the shark activity. We can think about a future option because we are planning to do like more uh, kind of established operation in, in Cabo San Lucas. But I would say everybody who's interested in doing this kind of activity with us, just send us an email. Maybe Kiko can write the contacto arroba Mexico Azul. Yeah. And we will let them know about, uh, maybe it's interesting that they could go with us for a tour one day tour, specifically if they live in Mexico, it's easy for them. We could go for one day tour see how they feel it. And from there, we can start talking what is, uh, what, what could they do with us and help each other, right? So. Okay, perfect. So we have the next one. And Carlo Hernandez asks, what are the three protect species in Mexico? Well, this is a very nice question. We have the great white shark, el tiburón blanco. We have the whale shark, el tiburón ballena. And we have the basking shark, el tiburón peregrino, which is a shark that is not really around Mexico, but it's just protected and it's there. It's a filter feeder and it's very common to see it in the Atlantic Ocean near Scotland, right? Even in the Mediterranean, pero peregrino, yeah. These are the three species. And now we are happy to say as well that the meco shark is included into the CITES. So there is like different kind of protections for sharks. You have the national protection, which is the Mexican Law 059, and you have international protection like CITES. CITES is what is helping, uh, like not, uh, not having an excessive trading of endangered species. And now that the MECO shark has been added to the appendix two of CITES, now we know that every time there is an exportation of MECO shark products, there needs to be like some documentation that certifies that this population and this fish Meko shark comes from a legal precedent, which is very important. Okay, next one. Do you think the, from Carlo Hernandez as well, do you think the increase in sightings is related to better, better tourism practices leading to finding sharks more efficiently? Well, what does he mean with more sightings? Do you think he means more sightings around the world? What I think, no, I think, Cabo, I think what, what he means is if we, okay. if we see, like, if we have higher abundances because our methods of attracting sharks have, are more efficient now. Well, that's a kind of a good, a good question because I don't think we are seeing more sharks than some years ago. I think that some years ago there was only one operator working and it, Cabo Shark Dive was starting his operation. So they were not going out at sea every day. So our data record would be a little bit more limited. Now we have more information because Cabo Shark Dive is growing as an operator. They have even more than one, two in high season. So this gives us the possibility to record more information. And that is something that we need to standardize when we are putting that into scientific information because it's not the same the numbers of sharks that we see in a year, that if we put that in proportion of the observation effort, is how many years have I been at sea? How many hours have I spent at sea? 
and how many sites have I seen per hour. So that is gonna be helping us to standardize the sightings. So there is a little bit of the two parts. We are more at sea and uh, we might get a little bit more efficient when recording the information, but in, there is different years. For example, 2018, we had a great year for some species and 2019, it was something different. So of course there are many other vari like uh, factors like oceanographic conditions that we have to get in consideration. And for that, we need more accurate tools and instruments like CTDs and a lot of oceanographic information that by now we're doing in a very not accurate way. We need money and funding as usual. Okay, so let's go to support this kind of <laughs> initiative, please. And uh, we have a question for Sarx for us and he is asking, uh, is there any project of shark tourists in Cerralbo Island or planning one for the future? Not, not from our side. I don't know if Kiko, you know more about Cerralbo. I know that it's pretty far away from La Paz. It's not very easy to get there. And I haven't been in myself involved with any project in Cerralbo. Maybe Kiko has some information about that point that I don't well, know. Well, that Cerralbo has like a I know there's a lot of sightings, shark sightings, mostly like blue sharks and mako sharks during winter, early spring, and sometimes smooth hammerheads, uh, like late spring. Uh, the thing with Cerralbo is that, as Clara said, it's a little bit far away, and not a lot of the tourist companies that work in La Paz go to Cerralbo regularly. So Cerralbo, of course, it is a very interesting place for us in terms of like shark abundance and shark populations there. And there's also like fisher, fishermen camps there. Uh, but the thing is, if, if maybe if there was like a tourist company that would make regular trips to Cerralbo, maybe we could start a project there. Right. Because it's, yeah. but as long as there is like no regular tourism activity going there, for us, it's a little bit hard to expand our project. And uh, that's, that's another important thing uh, regarding shark tourism, because there is like a lot of uh, ideas about we could turn a lot of fishermen camp into shark tourism points, but logistics, again, if the point for seeing sharks is very far away, if the weather conditions are not good during the whole year, there is not going to be a guarantee to make this operation um, kind of sustainable in the economic point of view. And if it's not sustainable, we cannot do a long-term monitoring. So whenever we want to do an ecotourism operation for sharks, logistics are going to be a very crucial point. Yes. Okay, so let's go to George Cummings. Um, George, sure. <laughs> I know him. What a pleasure. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll understand the question better. He's saying, greetings, Shark Angel, great presentation. <laughs> Thank you, George. And then he says, Cabo, deep water, black water diving, and sharks, have you tried? What are you seeing? Deep water, dark water, well, maybe George, maybe he should come to Cabo and dive with us. What we do actually, we don't see, we are not doing diving. When we are doing with, to Cabo to do our shark operation, the good thing is we can do it snorkeling. So that makes a lot of people uh, able to participate in this operation and to be part of these tours because you don't need to be a very good diver. You don't even need like a scuba diving certification. You can go as a snorkeler, get in the water, listen to the biologist, listen to the guides for safety and see an amazing pelagic shark. But in Cabo, apart from the four species of sharks that we already said, the silky shark, the mako shark, the smooth hammerhead, and the blue shark, we have also seen a Sirna lewini, which is like the common hammerhead. We have seen dusky sharks, we have seen Galapagos sharks, great whites, even a whale shark. So also we can see mobulus there, the humpback whales, the sea lions, dolphins, uh, marlins. So the life, the pelagic life in Cabo, it's, it's really, really amazing. And it depends on what time of the year you're going, you're gonna see some of the species or the others. It can be a hit or miss. Yes. Well, we have another question. We have a lot of questions, Clara. So it's really interesting the, okay. this webinar. We will, uh, if you miss the, the webinar, remember that it's recorded by uh, Mexico Azul. 
and future oceans. And we have a question that is the last one. I will jump some questions, but <laughs> we will read it. And Carlo Hernandez say, how is the process to make conscious with fishermen and tourist operators? What do you mean? What do you think is exactly the question? Sorry. I think that he is asking about how is the process that Mexico Azul of the uh, cities in science do to approach with fishermen or approach with um, tours operators to keep um, to follow the rules in the in the practices in the good practices and also for fishermen how well, attract fishermen to keep alive the sharks well that's a, a very interesting point because we have a project in uh, with some fishermen in manzanillo and and they are shark fishermen and we were actually working with them because they came to uh, mexico azul and they were asking for some support because they are shark fishermen and they noticed that every year they had to go farther spend more days at sea and the shark product was getting less and less paid. So they were trying to themselves to find an alternative because they were seeing that that was not going to be sustainable for them either. So what we did with them, we got together with them and we did two things. One of the first things was cooperating with them and trying to fund what we call a sustainable aquaculture farm. So nowadays we already give them a little amount of money and we are trying to get more resources for them. But what they have done with little, this little is a lot. They already got like the fields, they already have prepared a landfill where they can start doing the aquaculture farm process. So we are also working so we can get resources for these fishermen so they can start working in this aquaculture project and start not or at least fishing a little bit less every year until this aquaculture farm is working and is sustainably economically sustainable for them. And the other project as citizen science because this means that the fishermen they need to learn about aquaculture so they need to learn a little bit about scientific concepts to be able to perform that aquaculture. But the other process as well was that we had uh, a student coming from Europe and she was uh, doing her thesis, master thesis with this fisherman. And this fisherman would help her collecting the samples and these samples would be analyzed for marine pollutants. So at the end of the day, these fishermen also were part of the scientific team that was sampling shark meat for the thesis that was gonna be published in the next or two months. And with the crew in Cabo, maybe Kiko, you want to add something about the citizen science with the crew in Cabo. It has been a pretty complicated process because every time we go there, we see the operation. You have to understand how the tourist operation is working, what kind of information you can actually extract from the operation in the amount of time you have. And you also need to consider that when the biologist is not there, the only person who's going to be able to record this information is a photographer, which is at the same time the tour guide the shark guide and safety first. So of course, because safety first, our data collection is gonna be on a second, on a second importance. And we had to kind of be, do a very simple, very intuitive, even we were thinking about recording by voice, reading the data sheet and just recording it and send us to us every day. So we can have fresh data every day. Because one of our problems is that once we get to Cabo, we take all the information from all the data sheets on paper and pictures, but then the biologists in Mexico Azul will have to sit down, go through the papers, do the data entry into an Excel, take all the pictures and classify them day by day, uh, species by species. And that's a lot of work that is involved with citizen science. Yes. <laughs> so let's go to Alejandro, which has a question related to the last one. And he's saying, the relationship between science and tourism is difficult. What do you think is the biggest problem to establish that relationship with the tour operators and how to solve it? It's the follow-up. As you, you know, Kiko, we have had this problem. Sometimes the tour operator, uh, it's so busy, it's high season, they have a lot of tours, they are tired, they get, uh, it's the logistics. I mean, it seems super simple. It sounds very like playing, but the most important and the most difficult part is first of all, get the crew or the operators, the non-scientists trained, well-trained enough. 
Second of all, is making them do this data record day by day. At the beginning, we suddenly had one week of information, suddenly two weeks of gap of information because they forgot that they received at home or because there has been any of these little problems and that makes that they don't record any information. For me, the hardest point is the training, the follow-up, and the collection and organization of all of this data to make it useful for science. Okay. Uh, so, well, what I think about that is also that um, I think you have to find a tourist operator that's interested in what wow. you're doing. Because if they don't, if they're not interested, like luckily for us, like Jacob, Miguel, all of the guys that, that work in Cabo Shack Dive, uh, even if they started working with us since the beginning or, or they've been like joining afterwards, luckily for us, all of them have seen like really interested in what we do in the data we take. And of course, sometimes because they are doing a lot of things at the same time, they don't take the data. And sometimes it's hard for like the follow up with the data sheets and all of that. And it's a lot of work. But uh, fortunately, we have like a really good relationship with, with them. Um, they understand what we're doing. They're attracted by what we do. So I think that's another thing that's very important. With and this. also, yeah, you're totally right. I think that the human factor in this kind of projects that you have a good feeling with the person you're working with and you get like a very good relationship is going to make this project goes forward. If you start having like miscommunications and the human interaction is not good enough, the data is not going to work. So yes, it's very important what, just, what Kiko just said because we are in a very good uh, terms personally connected to Jacob, Miguel, and all the crew of Cabo Shark Dive. And especially, let's remember, Jacob is also a biologist and that can give us as well a little bit of help every now and then. Mm -hmm. And also I wanted to say, which is I think amazing, that after three years working with these operators, some of the people working as a crew, they are totally not related to science. And nowadays they are able to read scientific papers they know the scientific names of the animals and they even ask about scientific questions to us on the WhatsApp, which is pretty amazing yeah. for someone who's not a biologist to be reading a, or understanding what's Google uh, scholar or academics, right? Mariel? <laughs> uh, yeah, we have the, the last question is from Giacomo. And he's asking, do you think that the sport fishing in Cabo can be traced to your activity? I mean, if the sport fishing will have an important impact on shark population in the area? Well, that's a very good question. And I think we have to be very careful. One of the things, first things I could say is that fishing, recreational fishing, sports fishing in Cabo is the activity that has the biggest impact talking about economics. And, and also Cabo has been seen as a sport fishing destination for a long time. Uh, would we as biologists like to stop this sport fishing? That would be ideal. But there are so many other problems that sharks are facing now compared to the sports fishing. And it's such a hard and strong industry that I would say it's gonna be very hard for us to tell that ecotourism can actually substitute the role of uh, shark fishing, uh, sports fishing as an economic value. I think still sports fishing is very high uh, regarding economic revenue. But moreover, I think it would be very clever and very interesting to get close to these sports fishers and tell them, well, this is part of your job, fine, let's get together. What kind of sharks do you actually interact with? Do you, are you fishing, because they do catch and release, some of the shark species can kind of manage the stress, some others kind of die after this stress. So there is a, a very polemic thing regarding sports fishing. But if we could be able to make them part and become them citizen scientists, and they could record all the sharks that they actually interact with while their activity, at least that would give us more information and specifically from other areas because we cannot be together. Divers and fishermen are always <laughs> kind of far away. But uh, that would be one of a great solution, at least to start getting closer. Excellent. Well, we finished with the question right now. 
And we have just the last one is the MACO. Is MACO also is included in the U in the IUCN? I was actually well, answering that on a on a message, but okay, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Kiko. If you want to explain now, we already said. Well, that. I. I don't know if maybe there's like kind of a confusion. Maybe he got confused with CITES or a protection. Let's remember IUCN. It's an organization that um, evaluates right. the conservation status of animals uh, mm -hmm. and then lists them as, I don't know, like no least concerned species or near threatened, vulnerable, vulnerable uh, in danger of extinction, critically endangered or extinct in the wild, blah, blah, blah. So the question was, is the MACO in IUCN? Yes. Uh, the last evaluation was last year and uh, currently worldwide is uh, an endangered species. If you look at it locally, for example, in the Mediterranean is critically endangered. But for example, in the Pacific is uh, near threatened. So what... This is one of the play, uh, the reasons why we find the Mako so interesting and especially so interesting studying in, here in Mexico because uh, the only last stable population of Mako sharks is in the North Pacific where Mexico is. So why not use or yeah take advantage of the situation of our country and study them from here where is the last populate, stable population. It's like our responsibility to keep the Mako sharks population as we are the only and uh, the last apparently healthy reservoir in the Mexican Pacific. So, yeah, and especially as we said in, in some other presentations, when we talk about the Mako shark, it has a very hard life cycle. So it needs to get like 18 years old, the females to get sexually mature. They don't reproduce every year, every two or three years. They don't have a lot of pups. I mean, um, it's, one of, it's the second most shark species in the world after the blue shark. Uh, they say it's one of the most delicious shark meat. So it has a lot of cons for animal and they, uh, it's critically, it's in danger everywhere, almost everywhere. So we have the responsibility to take care of the nice population we have near Mexico. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. As, as we see in the presentation, as we saw in the presentation, we have 113 species in Mexico and just three protected and one is, two are here. So <laughs> the, the other one. shark and the other one. So it's an emerging calling to save sharks in Mexico, to enjoy uh, for sharks in Mexico, snorkeling, even if you are not an expert or diver, you can enjoy from, from the sharks and know and borrow this image of the sharks that are dangerous and they eat people. It's not true. Exactly. Uh, you, you need to be underwater and feel the emotion. It's a beautiful experience. Personally, it's beautiful. And I invite all the people, all the audience to visit Mexico, visit the north of California, Baja California, and well, to enjoy of these beautiful animals. And we have the last question, Clara. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> they say, uh, what about blue shark? A really treated shark around the world do the things? Sorry, what was the question again? Like, uh, I think Giacomo is asking like, what about the blue shark? Because it's a really threatened shark okay. because of its fins, because it's the most fish species in the world. Uh, so maybe you're, he's asking what are, what our are plans? Or, or is he asking like, what are our plans with blue shark? Like, like in terms of research or? Well, yeah, I think so because it's, it's the more, um, where is one of the most, uh, in danger of fisher sharks for the fins. So yeah, I think that is. Well, the thing is that we didn't have a lot of experience with blue sharks until 2018, where it actually, they show up in Cabo and in previous years they had not been there. So we were very surprised. When they came, they come like uh, more than one together. And we noticed that the interaction with the blue shark was very intense. 
uh, is one of the most shark species in the world because it has no protection, it's very migratory as the meko shark. And when a shark species is in international waters, it is very hard to protect them because they move a lot. And then you need a coordination of all the countries to actually protect the same shark. So when they are highly migratory, countries might say, okay, if I'm gonna protect it in my country, it's gonna go to the next one, it's gonna be fished in there. Also, the blue shark has a very specific characteristic, and it's a collagen. It's a very flexible shark. It was actually scary for me the first time I was interacting with the blue shark because I have, I don't have a big camera. I have a, a little GoPro, and of course, when the shark comes to you, one of the first things you do is you put the camera in front of them, and they just go. But for me, you know, I put my GoPro like that, and this animal was just turning completely. And was I was able to see his mouth next to me because he's so flat. This animal is so flexible, so that's one of the points that maybe for shark fin soup is very kind of valuable because it's very a lot of collagen, a lot of like um, gelatin texture. And at the end of the day, this fin soup is only uh, appreciated because of the texture that the cartilage of the shark uh, kind of put into the soup. And it's something that is also a big issue for sharks. More than 100 million sharks die every day because of finning, and it's an illegal practice. So let's remember as well, there is a law that fishermen should not disembark uh, sharks. Uh, I mean, only shark fins. They need to bring the whole shark, and then they can put the fins apart. But it's not only that you can cut the fins in the ocean and just take the fins and leave the shark. That's the finning, and it's totally illegal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, blue sharks are really interesting, but as Clara said, we just started seeing them uh, regularly uh, until two years ago. So we're just starting to get like our data from blue sharks. Uh, but yeah, for sure, they're super uh, interesting species. Um, sadly, this year, uh, the blue shark season was caught by the COVID we <laughs> pandemic. Missed and we missed some of the data, but... Um, yeah, for sure it's on our plans to generate data from these species in Mexico because I don't think, well, yeah, in Mexico there is, but like in, in, in Cabo San Lucas particularly, there's not a lot of data of sharks. So um, it's... And we are actually collaborating with a tour operator in Spain, Marco Paco, Isaias Cruz. He's also having a lot of interactions with blue sharks. So the next thing we're going to do is try to do like photo ID of the blue sharks, maybe manually first, and compare if we have similar animals because the interaction in Spain that Isaias, Marco Paco is living with the blue sharks, they don't get too close, they are not too big. And in Cabo, we get like very huge animals. They come straight to the people and you know, you need to like redirect them because they are very straightforward. So it's very two different kind of behaviors, which is funny. Yes. Okay, we, we really appreciate Clara and Kiko, your support in this week of webinars. This, this is the last one. Uh, hopefully a lot of people can see this beautiful work that Mexico Sul uh, do in the song. And please, if you have any comment and question, don't be shy to ask directly to Mexico Azul. They will be happy to answer. And also, uh, it's a calling, as, <laughs> as we said, for all the sharks to let's go to save sharks and be conscious also um, about our habits, what we eat. Remember that a lot of sharks that we see in the market and in the supermarket also, we, we, can, we can say that is what they say. Sometimes it's shark. So uh, be aware with what you eat. Uh, so yeah, if you have any comment, Clara or Kiko, to finish this webinar, uh, I just want to say thank you to, thanks so much to Mexico Azul for support this wow. uh, effort and Pelagios Cacunja, Pro Natura Noreste, and of course to Pangea Seed Foundation and SeaWorlds, Artists for the Ocean. Our purpose in this webinar is to giving a voice to ocean and to sharks also. And hopefully we can, the next year in February, do an amazing work in murals and give a voice to the ocean in La Paz and Los Cabos. That would be great. From my side, I just want to say thank you, Maria, for your invitation to Pangea Seed, Pelagios, Pernatura. It's been a pleasure sharing 
all this information and we hope that it has been a little bit uh, informative for the people and they understood and at least we could give a, a good picture of what you can see in Baja because a lot of tourism it's like focused on the resort and party at night and it, you know you can go to Cabo and see like this amazing marine life that maybe a lot of uh, people are not even expecting to find so it's a good point that we can actually change a little bit that perception and think about the Gulf of California and Baja as an aquarium and we should keep it that way. Uh, yeah, and from, from my side, uh, I just wanna thank you, Marielle, for the invitation. I think all of the webinars were like super interesting. And I also want to invite people to just <laughs> get into the ocean. The ocean is full of surprises. You never know what you're gonna get. And believe me, even on the worst days, there's something in the ocean that will surprise you. So. Yeah, that's right. We, we belong to the oceans also, signs the belly of our mom. So <laughs> thanks so much to all guys, to the public, and uh, follow us in the media, in Mexico Azul, in Pangea City, in Future Oceans, and Pelagios Cacunja. And well, this is, this is, uh, the final webinar. So if you want mm -hmm. to see it again, uh, see, uh, you can see and find the webinars online. Thanks Thank so much, you guys. guys. Have a wonderful weekend. You, you too. too. Thank you. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you.